Beware, citizen. You are now departing from the world of allowable opinion. The Tom Woods Show. Welcome, everybody. It's Monday, May 12th, 2014. We're talking today about how to navigate today's economy. On this program, Monday through Friday, we cover all kinds of topics, usually centering around liberty, economic liberty, political liberty, civil liberty, history, economics, etc. All these sorts of topics are covered. Today, the topic is, what do you do to prosper today that you didn't have to do 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago? What has changed? Why has it changed? And how can you prosper Make sure you subscribe to this program so you don't miss a single precious gem like this episode by going to TomWoodsRadio.com on the homepage and clicking on the iTunes or Stitcher subscription links. Charles Hugh Smith is the principal writer at the blog Of Two Minds, which you can find at OfTwoMinds.com. He writes for a variety of outlets. He's the author of many books. You can check them all out at of2minds.com. And I'm very glad to welcome to the program Charles Hugh Smith. Charles, welcome to the Tom Woods Show. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for inviting me. Well, what an important book this is. And the, the title really grabs you. Get a job, build a real career, defy a bewildering economy. Before we went on, I was telling you that I'm surprised it's taken this long for a book like this to come out, a book that isn't just a bunch of platitudes, that doesn't just repeat Ben Franklin's advice about getting up early in the morning or whatever, but that really navigates you, explains what's gone on with the economy, and navigates you through it with specific advice. So before we get into some examples of this, I want you to explain, if you could, what is it that's different about this economy today in 2014 that is different from the economy, say, 30 years ago in 1984, or even in the 1990s. When I graduated from college in 94, everybody was in great spirits because we all knew we were all going to go out and be successful. We left college, the, the sky was the limit, and there were jobs aplenty, and all you had to do was follow the traditional career paths, go to college, major in anything, and you would be successful. That's all changed. Why? Why has that changed? What happened? Well, Tom, I think that's what's bewildering to virtually all of us is um, because change happens uh, without explaining itself. You know, we're, we're observers, and then we have to seek out explanations of what we're observing. And um, one of the key uh, drivers of, of the change is, as we all know, technology. And the way I describe the change is the uh, um, Robotics and, and software started replacing factory assembly labor way back in the 70s. And um, the result was hundreds of thousands of jobs in auto industry and steel and, and uh, traditional manufacturing disappeared because it was just so much cheaper and better to um, have machines do this kind of assembly work. And now technology is advanced with um, the speed of processing and the, the cheap memory and, you know, all the things we know about. Um, it's now moved from the factory floor um, to the service sector where most of the jobs are and where most of the middle class jobs are now. And so that has really changed the environment of how do you create value? In, in an economy where, you know, robotics and software are replacing any kind of human labor that's a process. So that's really what every person who intends to enter the labor market has to ask himself. It can't just be a matter of automatically just expecting that a job will come to you automatically or that by following the path blazed by your father or his father that you're guaranteed any kind of stability in an economy like this. Well, let me ask you a specific question that will be relevant to a good many of my listeners, many of whom are young. I want to jump ahead to the, the college question, because I understand why some people may say college is a waste of time for a lot of people, and a lot of people have no business being there, and they're just blowing an enormous amount of their parents' money to party for four years, and then we find in surveys they don't know anything additional at the end of the four years than they knew when they entered. But at the same time, given that a college degree is used by, well, a great many private employers as at least an indication 
that you completed something. It's easy for us to tell people, oh, you don't, it's, it's not so clear that you all need to go to college. It's easy for us to say that. But then when they try to get that job, won't they just be vainly protesting that, no, I do have skills, I do have knowledge that you need? How do they convey that to an employer without the, the college degree, which has played that sifting role of candidates for so long? Well, Tom, I think you've uh, just perfectly encapsulated the, the real dilemma facing anybody of college age and um, the parents and families of people uh, of college age is the credential of a college degree is still used as a filter, if, if, uh, if we can use that word, to kind of filter out who's uh, potentially qualified to do some job. Um, but on the other hand, the economy is, is changing underneath all that from a credential-based economy to a what I call a duocracy, where what you can do, what you can accomplish, is becoming more important than your credential. And um, we can see this in, um, say, as an example, there's a lot of uh, computer coding schools popping up around the country where um, these are intensive programs that last a few months, uh, no more than six months, where, you know, all day long you're taught to code, you know, programming, in a way that that employers will hire you right right out of the gate. In other words, your skills are um, up to date and and they're specific. And so um, a lot of these schools are running into uh, government bureaucracy that demands, well, uh, to explain your curriculum and and how do you credential things? And it's all like <laughs> the schools are kind of caught off guard. Like we're not we don't care about credentials. We're teaching skills that get these people employed. Our, our focus is not on credentialing. And so that sort of illustrates the the um, divide between the value of the credential, which is declining and the value of actually being able to do stuff that it creates value in the real economy, which is gaining in value. But we're in that awkward period where we don't have a, a good third choice, you know, and so these coding schools that are arising, they're like a third way. In other words, they, they are teaching you real skills of value, but they're not a four-year, you know, bachelor's degree. Now, you think very uh, cynically about the higher education system. You have some bullet points at one point in the book in which you, you make some claims that will sound startling to some people about what higher education is all about. I mean, it sounds to me as if you're saying it's kind of a racket when you think of how much they're charging for something that today ought to be extremely inexpensive, given the ability we have to deliver it inexpensively. Let's contrast this with what you're describing as the nearly free university model. What do you mean by that? Well, Tom, I think that um, the, the main point of my book, The Nearly Free University, is uh, to explore what you just said, which was the technology we have now can deliver high-quality education at nearly no cost. In other words, the cost of an Internet connection. And so why is college costing um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in many cases when the cost of delivering a high-quality education is near zero. And the only answer that I come up with is higher education is a classic cartel. And, and we know that cartels, um, we, we speak of cartels like the, um, the oil cartel or um, back in the bad old days of, um, of capitalism in, in 1910 when uh, Standard Oil, you know, had a, had a lock on, on oil in the United States. I see the higher education uh, system as a cartel because they control um, the product that everybody um, is told they need, which is a college diploma. And so there's no real competition. Uh, if you look at the pricing of, of universities, it's all like, well, we only cost um, you know twenty nine thousand a year, and somebody else you know charges thirty eight thousand. But <laughs> there's nobody charging say five thousand for an entire four year diploma, which I think is the market value if you had real competition. Now you talk in the book about accrediting yourself, and I take that to mean that we're not thinking in terms of using some other institution to do the accrediting, but you accredit yourself as a way of uh, marketing yourself to businesses. How does, just, just give us a, maybe a, just a flavor 
of how somebody goes about accrediting himself. This is something that you would have to do in this economy that you didn't have to do 20 or 30 years ago. That's right, Tom. And um, I think just as a, as a sort of initial contextual comment, I will say that one of the um, big reasons why it's um, the traditional path of just get a degree in anything and, and you've got a job is there's an overcapacity in, in the entire global economy. In other words, there's pretty much more of everything except jobs. <laughs> and so what's, what we have an abundance of is um, people willing to work and people with college degrees who are willing to work. And what we have a shortage of is um, jobs that create um, a lot of value in the economy. And so, um, you know, that's why an employer is going to is going to hire you. And, and I speak as someone who um, has started several businesses, hired a bunch of different people um, in the 80s. And uh, so, and I've also, of course, been an, an employee myself and um, worked for small business. And so I think I'm pretty well um, situated to answer that question because I sat on both sides of the table. I'm, I'm trying to find out whether you can do the work I need you to do. And um, I've also been trying to convince somebody that I can do the work they need done. And so a credit yourself is basically filling the information hole that, that, is, that a resume and diploma Leaves. In other words, if you're an employer, you get a diploma, you know, somebody says, I got a four-year degree, or even a master's degree. It doesn't really say anything about whether they have real-world world, real world skills or whether they have the character traits that I need, um, which are integrity, uh, accountability, ability to communicate, um, ability to work with others well. And then none of that comes through in a diploma. It's assumed, but there's no evidence for that. And then the same is true of a one-page resume. You know, and there's a thousand books about how to write a resume, but as an employer, um, I look at uh, whatever you've got on your resume, and again, I'm, I'm not really sure that uh, about what your skill set is. <laughs> and so um, what the accredit yourself idea is, show your potential employer that you can do these things. By, by putting your projects your, um, online. And I would suggest not a, in a Facebook page, um, which is unprofessional, or a, a tweet or something like that. You need a blog or a website that's yours and that you can post evidence that you have these skills, that you can um, work well with others, that you can communicate effectively, that you're a problem solver. And um, that's, that's how you get a job. You have to fill that information vacuum um, for your employer, because a degree and a, and a um, resume don't really say much. Now, your book has a lot of specific advice about exactly how to go about doing this. So I, I want to refer people to your book, which, of course, again, has the, uh, the fantastic grab-you-by-the-throat title, Get a Job, Build a Real Career, and Defy a Bewildering Economy. I want to ask you, at what age do you think young people should start thinking in this way, should start thinking about assembling a portfolio of whatever kind of work they're interested in doing, becoming at least somewhat familiar with designing a website? Of course, you can outsource that, but when you're 15 years old, you might not have the allowance money to do that, so maybe you have to at least have a blog, which isn't, doesn't take that much work. When should you start thinking in this way? Uh, Tom, I would recommend about age 16, while you're still in high school and you're still um, preparing yourself um, for a career. And I think we need to differentiate a bit between um, having a job and having a career. And what um, most of us with ambitions for um, a satisfying work life and, and some sense of prosperity or security, we want a career, not just a job. And so um, that's, that's a key difference because you might be able to get a job, but if it's a dead-end job, then you're not going to really have a career, and you want control over your career. And so that, that's going to require a lot of nurturing, and you, know, you have to develop a lot of things in order to have a real career as opposed to just um, getting a job. So at, at, say, at age 16, you can start um, asking yourself, what kind of work do I enjoy? You know, what field of, of interest am I interested in, and then try to get a um, try to get some work experience in that field. And, um, of course, we all know about the, um, the sort of scam that a lot of businesses are running where they offer you an internship unpaid, 
and then you do some scut work and don't really learn much, um, you have to differentiate between an internship that you don't really learn anything in and a job, even if it's unpaid, where you're actually doing work in the sector you're interested in. And, and, and one example I often use is so many people go to law school because they, they've been told this is the path to, you know, uh, wealth and, you know, uh, certain employment, but they never spent, you know, a, an hour in an actual law office practicing um, the field of law. Then they get the law degree, and they discover they hate the entire practice of law. You know, the day-to-day work of 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 a legal um, field, and so and the same can be said of healthcare and and a, and a hundred other things. And so, it's really important to get out there and volunteer at a hospital. You know, in summer, if you're interested in that field, or um, if you're interested in the building trades, um, you know, volunteer to help whoever's maintaining your church. You know, um, or this kind of community um, level access to experience, and that's what I recommend. Because if you don't know um, whether you're really going to like the work, you don't want to commit five years of, of of your life to something and then discover you hate the actual day to day practice of it. Yeah, well, of course, of course. Now that example of doing some volunteer work, if necessary, to get some experience and to show that you know what you're doing and to see if you actually like it is, of course, very good. And it also, when you gave the example of the building trades, it sort of anticipated my follow-up question, which is, I can understand how somebody who wants to go into some computer-related field uh, or some design field could assemble a portfolio, even at age 16 or 17, and say, this is what I've already started working on. But how does somebody who just wants to go into, who is more suited, let's say, to just traditional blue-collar work, how does he survive in this sort of economy? He's not going to be able to market himself in quite the same way, or is he? Uh, well, Tom, I think I think the process is very similar, and I speak from experience because I um, I earned a, my bachelor's degree in, in philosophy, um, a classically worthless uh, degree in terms of applicable skills, but I worked my way through college um, in the building trades, and so by the time I graduated from college, I was... Um, Already pretty handy with um, you know pouring concrete, um, installing drywall, carpentry, um, you name it. And so I sort of, um, in a way, had two degrees: <laughs> one the academic degree, and the other one the practical degree. And what I've discovered, as many um, many of us know, who are engaged in community um, activities or organizations, and these can be like bicycle clubs, churches. Um, the farmers markets there's just hundreds of community groups most of which are desperate for um go to guys and gals in other words people who can get stuff done because the organization doesn't have enough money to pay some professional to do it so the community economy is what i call that sector of our economy and it usually has a lot of um of opportunities to get experience in everything from Writing and, and distributing newsletters to um, you know um, leadership roles like leaving, leading a subcommittee that's going to take care of one particular task for the organization, or you know maintenance. Uh, most a lot of churches, for example, um, are you know uh, decades old and they they often have maintenance issues, and so um, that's one way to to um, get involved in in the trades. And in terms of accrediting your skill in the trades. I would say, say you wanted to build um, cabinets or you wanted to become a cabinet maker, and if you could um, find someone who would um, take you on as an apprentice or at least let you help, then you might learn enough to repair a cabinet, say. And then if you took photos of that process, like what the problem was, you know, the doors, say, falling off and, and the hinges have pulled loose from the wood or something, it's like take a photo of the problem, Take a photo of how you solve the problem and take a photo of the finished product. Nice. Now, now, if I'm an employer or a client, a potential client, and I would look at those that look short sequence and I'd say, gosh, this guy really knows how to solve problems. And now that probably is a good indication he can solve my problem and I'll be happy to pay him because people who can solve problems are actually pretty rare. <laughs> and, and if you can become a problem solver, I think you've got guaranteed employment. There are all kinds of uh, entrepreneurial uh, ways to uh, distinguish yourself 
and to find a niche for yourself in this economy. I have a friend who recommends helping local businesses promote themselves. The typical local businessman knows nothing about YouTube, even though it's free. It's a free way to promote himself. He knows nothing about it. He doesn't know how to design a website or a functioning one. There are so many things people need. And so, in other words, sometimes you have to think in terms of not what I want to give. That's ideal. It'd be nice if you could do what you most want to do. But if that's somehow closed off to you, you should think in terms of what do people want, and then you give them what they want. You have to think. You can't, again, you can't do what I did in 1994 and just go out and say, well, I've got a history degree, so my life's going to turn out great. And by the way, my life did turn out great because I happened to be born in 1972 and things sort of worked out for me. Now, I want to ask you, though, you have a section in the book on what you call the eight essential skills of professionalism. And these are skills that you're not generally taught or going to learn in a traditional educational setting. Take maybe two of these. Tell us about them and tell us where you do learn them. I'm glad you brought that up, Tom, because um, as um, once you're in the world of work, um, what you want in your colleagues, and it, it, you're either your um, subordinates, um, your colleagues, your boss, Everybody you, you work with, what you want most is a professional, someone who leaves their home life and problems, you know, out of the work environment, someone who can communicate clearly, who um, can, can keep learning so um, that they're able to be flexible as, as the problem sets that arise change. So what we're really talking about is in these eight skills is the skills of of professionalism that make you a person that everybody wants to work with. And if, if you become the person everybody wants to work with, well, then <laughs> you, you've you got guaranteed work um, through for your entire life. You, you're the one that gets the choice. Um, and so, say, um, in, an, in an environment like we have now where um, change is, is, is speeding up, the um, ability to be flexible is... Um, critical. That's one of my um, key skills. And uh, what does that mean to be flexible? Well, it means you have to keep learning. You have to um, learn how to learn, if you will, and recognize that um, one of your key skills going forward is to um, lifelong learning. There, there's no, never going to be a point now in which you can say, oh, I, I got a degree in, say, chemistry, and I've learned everything I need to know, and now I can just keep doing the same work for 30 years. Even traditional uh, uh, careers like law enforcement, um, nursing, you name it. It's like constant uh, flow of new technology and new learning. So you've got to have uh, the ability to learn uh, constantly. And then I think um, it's often lost on us uh, because we deal with so many bureaucracies um, that accountability is a key uh, professional skill. In other words, when you say you're going to do something, that you actually uh, can do it and you acquire the resources you need to get it done. And if um, there's a problem, you uh, get out there and, and find someone who can help you solve that problem and keep moving forward. And, you know, bureaucracies are basically designed to um, eliminate accountability. And that's a lot of our um, structural problems, <laughs> you know, in, in, in government and, um, and in global corporations. It's um, people are... Uh, basically find a way to avoid accountability. But in the real world of, of doing productive work, you've got to be accountable. So these are two, two or three examples of these eight skills. Charles, you have a blog that is pretty well thought of. How can people find that? Um, I'd uh, love to have you visit me at of2minds.com and um, see what I have to offer. Um, you know, Tom, I I, um, I want to go back real quickly to um, something that we were talking about in terms of um, of what kind of work is going to make uh, is going to make you a career, and and you brought up an excellent example about uh, social media, and the, uh, what I wanted to kind of develop on that is. Uh, I know a lot of small business people that aren't quite as tech savvy as myself, and you're absolutely right. There's a crying need across thousands of businesses um, for someone to help them understand how to promote their business on with social media. And 
what I've found, um, just to kind of develop that thought, is there's a lot of people advertising um, their, I'll help you with your social media, but um, they're not personally present to the business. They're, they're off somewhere else. And where the real value proposition is, is that the small business person wants to meet an, a, a real live human being they can discuss this with. <laughs> And so there's a real strong value proposition there in, 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 in being local. In other words, like, yeah. and, and I think that this is one of the key points that I, um, I want young people to understand is the opportunities are global in the sense that you can, you can um, do work for somebody in another country or another state, but they're, they're also intensely local. Bringing these global kind of technology skills and stuff to the local community is, is like a, is a crying need. And I have seen, because I was involved to one degree or another in Ron Paul's presidential campaigns, and he had a lot of young people, and they were, so many of them, very, very tech-savvy at a very young age. So this is the sort of skill that a lot of young people have already. They just don't know how to monetize it, or it never occurred to them to monetize it. And now right. here it is. And, um, Tom, we have a, a term, you know, the economists use these terms um, – Human capital and social capital, and uh, we those terms are used to differentiate um, the the capital that's represented by your knowledge and your skills, as opposed to say a a, a machine, you know, a, a um, or financial capital. And so, um, what another large scale trend in our economy is the cost of tools. Uh, that make money are is is declining rapidly, and, and of course we all know um, computers are falling. So you can get a very good computer for five hundred bucks. You can get a, um, a, a table saw for five hundred bucks, and nowadays you can get a three D fabrication, you know, so called printer for about five fifty as well, a, a low end three uh, D uh, printer. And so um, what's what matters here is the costly part of, of the equation of creating value is now human capital. It's the human skills that take these cheap tools and generate value. So, and then the other uh, kind of capital um, is social capital, and that's the ability to find groups um, that, that you can work with, that um, you can collaborate with, and that will help promote your um, business and skills. And so um, that's a key element. And um, social media is good, but it doesn't replace face-to-face contact with with a group of collaborators and peers who you can learn from, who can help you promote your business, who you can help do their work. And that's how you get clients. That's how you get jobs. Well, Charles, I appreciate your time today. I really urge people to check out your book, Get a Job, Build a Real Career, and Defy a Bewildering Economy. You have a bunch of other titles. People can find out all about those and all about you and follow you over at of2minds.com. Thanks so much for being here. It was a real pleasure. Thank you, Tom. All right, everybody, a couple quick announcements before I let you go. I'm going to be speaking in Boston on June 2nd, and if you get your ticket in advance and then show up to the event, you get a free subscription to my libertyclassroom.com website. The rest of you guys who aren't in the Boston area and can't be there get 50% off that site, which is a site where you learn the history and economics they didn't teach you. You get 50% off with coupon code DISCOUNT in all caps. I'll also be in St. Paul, St. Paul, Minnesota on June 19th. You can get details on those events on my events page at TomWoods.com. TomWoods.com slash events is my events page. And then finally, tomorrow, we're going to be talking to the author of Smaller, Faster, Lighter, Denser, Cheaper, How Innovation Keeps Proving the Catastrophists Wrong. Robert Bryce will be our guest tomorrow. See you then. The Tom Woods Show. 